not super helpful, but you know. It gets the job done, I guess. Boobies. That... Nothing. No boobies? Yes, boobies, but that also that, that doesn't really... Saying boobies doesn't really help with getting mic levels. Generally speaking, because of uh, the shortness of the phrase. But you also boobies. You also tend... That also doesn't help because you're doing it and nobody talks like this all the time. Oh, I could do it, it also, for the whole hour if you want me to. It also... Uh, you, you tend to whisper boobies as opposed to your normal spoken words that have that exhume from your from your mouth hole. No, I pretty much say everything at this level. That's why I'm not good in crowds. I, I can I can tell you that is categorically untrue because <laughs> I look at the waveform and I can see how loud it is and measure it. Hmm. <laughs> and I know that uh, <laughs> Anyway, how you been? How you been? Hey, do anything interesting this last weekend? Nope, nothing at all. Nothing at all. Yep, mm. just sat in a in a in a white room and ate saltines. That, that sounds like a shitty weekend. I was at SCG Con. Hey, yo, Star City Games Convention in Cincinnati. We were both there this last weekend. If you are watching the live, which probably nobody is, but if you are watching the live, that was this past weekend. If you're listening to the podcast as a post, it was this past weekend. If you're listening to it in the future, uh, it was not this past weekend. Yes. Uh, it may have been a weekend ago. It may have been like five years ago, for all I know. Yeah, I if you're listening to this uh, in, in 2028, hey, thank you. <laughs> also, find something better to do. <laughs> We are, this we are, information will be very outdated. <laughs> you will, you will be, you will be using, and maybe they're using this as like to write a research paper on um, the downfall of Wizards of the Coast. Maybe, maybe, but it was a good time. Yeah, it was a good time at the Star City Games. We got to see our our, our one of our internet friends, subscriber and moderator of the Dungeon Bros live streams. We being the Dungeon Bros, of course. Yes, I am Connor. And I'm Sam. And we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. And this is the Dungeon Bros podcast. But uh, the Dungeon Bros lives, one Brandon Vol was there. We got to meet him, play with him a little bit. We got lunch. It was, mm-hmm. it was, it was lovely. It was yeah, lovely. Good time. Played a little, played a little uh, uh, two-headed giant commander, the two of us. Yes. I used my, my Feather the Redeemed deck and you had Ivy. I did. It was wonderful. We it didn't. Up, it didn't exactly go how we planned it to go, um, but we did end up winning our, our we match. We did. We did end up winning. Um, I will say that it kind of went how I would. I, I was kind of expecting it to go that way. Eventually, like toward the end, uh, once it's like, all right, hand hand sizes are small. We just gotta. We just gotta go. Well, I mean, from the you know? from the from like the the preparation, everything we were doing, like looking yeah. through our cards, like this is how we want to do this. Yeah, kind of the game plan. You know, Quickly, the other people had uh, a, well, a game plan much, as well. They had a much faster start than us too. They did. It we were a little, we were both a little mana screwed at the beginning, both a little bit, and both. then they removed our commanders. Yeah, we clawed ourselves. We called our, clawed ourselves back. Ended up getting that dub. Uh, also on Sunday, Sam was not there because he was playing D and D. Uh, that's not true. I like D and D, but I was I managed to play some CEDH, some competitive commander with one Ryan from playing with Power on YouTube. Nice. So that was pretty, that was really fun. We had a, we have a mutual friend with uh, with Ryan in our in our friend Lincoln, Honest Abe. Yes, it's a wonderful time. Highly recommend. Uh, if you want to see us, we're going to be at. Uh, Gen Con at the beginning of August. Yeah, just two weeks away. It's very exciting. I can't wait. We're we're getting we're getting a we're getting a big old Airbnb. We're gonna be staying with some internet friends and some real life friends and a few a few real things. life enemies, possibly um, we a might few fictional enemies. We're probably yeah. gonna make some new enemies. Hopefully. Yeah. If you would like to be our enemy, please apply at the uh, link in our link in our bio. Yeah. The, uh, in that link in the bio, we've added our Moxfield account as well, so you can see our deck lists for our Monday night live streams uh, when we play Magic the Gathering. But We've got a very exciting sponsor this week for the Dungeon Press Podcast. <laughs> TikTok Live NPCs. All of them. All every single one. Every one of them. Every single one of them. If you have you do you want to to send digital currency to live creators and have them act like they're they're an anime person that's being controlled by an AI bot? Check out TikTok Live NPCs. Ooh, yum. Donut munch. Ooh, flower smells great. Ooh, glizzy. <laughs> Thank you. It TikTok Live NPCs. Thank you for sponsoring the Dungeon Bros podcast. 
Not exactly sure. Uh, this is the, the, the you have you have told me about this thing. I've never witnessed. <laughs> you this. haven't seen it. It is all no. over TikTok. It is it is a big fucking deal on TikTok. I have mo- I have spoken to multiple people at work that are on TikTok that are that have begun seeing these and they're like, "What the fuck is happening?" You know, now that you said I'm going to see them, but uh, I don't. I'm not sure I want to. Well, you're, you're gonna. Well, the whole bit it was like this one this one girl this one woman was like making a bit out of it and just seeing how many live gifts she could get. I don't know how she came up with this fucking idea, but she was making like $2,000 a stream. Damn. And so now people were like taking the piss and clowning on her. And then someone was like, she's actually like, it was revealed how much she was making. And then people were like, man, you're not going to catch me. If you fucking see me go live, say nothing and continue on your way. And then all these people are now live pretending to be AI and PC bots and are just raking in TikTok live gifts. Hopefully that trend passes quickly. If not, hopefully we get in on it while it's still profitable. You know, I saw, there was one. There was one guy. This this man, this black man, was live for eleven and a half hours. Holy and crap! Made like a lot of money in live gifts. And his whole shtick was that he was like he was like playing the part of like an aggressive black guy. So and it was so like he was getting gifts, and he would be he would be like. It would be like, basketball, and then he'd lean in and he'd give like the side eye, and he's like, you just giving me that because I'm black? Basketball, you just giving me that because I'm black? And like that kind of shit. Hmm. It's hilarious. Motherfucker looked exhausted. <laughs> I mean, you do anything for 11 and a half hours and you're going to be That's fucking true. tired. That's true. I haven't been asleep in 11 and a half hours. You know, if I'm, I'm awake for 11 yeah. and a half hours, I'm pretty tired. That I mean, I'm, I'm in a perpetual state of tired. That's fair. That's fair. It's, it, it's the summer. It'd be like that. Uh, one last thing I want to talk about. I want to shout out that these people are not actually sponsors of the Dungeon Bros podcast, uh, but Dungeon Alchemist. Have you heard of Dungeon Alchemist? I have. I have heard of Dungeon Alchemist. I've never interacted you, with it. You can get it on Steam. They have. I, they had like a Kickstarter, I think, or like early access. Something. The, there's. It's a Steam game technically, but it's a map builder for Dungeons and Dragons. It's a 3D AI generating map builder. So like. You draw the shape of a room on a grid, and then you can set certain parameters, and you can hit generate, and it'll pop up, and it'll mm. generate this like three D environment. And you can uh, click in doorways, and you can regenerate and regenerate. You can also take the individual assets if you want to meticulously like build it yourself, kind of a thing. Um, it's like forty five dollars on Steam, which, as far as like big AAA games release, this is not a AAA game by the way. No, but like big releases, it's like seventy bucks. So 45, it's not ridiculous, and all of their updates so far have been free updates of adding new assets. Uh, you can you can uh, export these maps into other virtual tabletops. Uh, you can print 2D versions once you have created them. You can add lighting effects. Um, there's this really cool. They they have integration now with Hero Forge. So if you create a a miniature on Hero Forge. You can order your miniature like they they normally would, but you can also download the file where you would do 3D printing. You can color your you can get color for your miniature, download that 3D file, and then I, you either link the account or you download the file and upload the file, and then you can have your mini in uh, the virtual tabletop setting as well, cool. which I think is really cool. I am planning on purchasing it and checking it out because I would like to run a, a digital game with my college friends who live far, far away, away yes, and they've indeed. been hassling me that indeed. for a while. So that's really cool. Uh, I'm also obsessed with Final Fantasy 16 right now. So, yeah. Highly recommend. <laughs> Highly recommend. It is. It is. I've heard good things about it. It is. It is very good. Mostly for me. Uh, also on other, like, uh, like the guys who I watch who do um, achievement hunting. Yes. A couple of them have done achievement hunting on that. And they're like, and like, it's pretty straightforward to get all the achievements. But it's real good. Oh, it is. Like even and and even very nice. even the grindiest of achievements on that one aren't that grindy if you just play the yeah. game. There's a lot of people that are complaining like about the side quests in Final Fantasy 16 right now, and like I kind of get like they're no worse than any other side quest in any other game. Like they're they're the same side quests you would get in Assassin's Creed mm-hmm. or Far Cry or literally any other vaguely open world game it's not really open world it's fairly linear but it, it opens up like maps yeah you can travel through you can run around in um 
but like the the storytelling is so fucking good there's like there's like there, there theme themes of of oppression and racism and political intrigue and and nations and it's so fucking good it is so good the gameplay is great if you like devil may cry or if you think you're bad at devil may cry you you'll be fine here <laughs> you'll be fine it's kind of easy and the side quests, you like the production value of the side quests compared to like the main sequences of the game. It's like okay, we can see where corners were cut, but a damn good game, highly recommend. I love the world of Valisthea, and of course, me being me, I'm like, there's a lot of there's a lot of gaps and timelines here that that you could slot in a nice little D and D campaign <laughs> in the world of Valisthea. Highly recommend. Um, that's all. That's enough. I feel like that's enough waffling. Unless you have other no, waffles, I have. Let's go on to uh, the you would like to consume. Let's go on to the upcoming releases. Of course, as always, uh, coming up this the soonest, and we will be talking about uh, for a portion of this podcast. Bigby presents the glory of the giants on August fifteenth. On the same day, we have the practically complete guide to dragons. September nineteenth, Fandel Room Below, the Shattered Obelisk, Planescape Adventures in the Multiverse, October sixteenth, and the Book of Many Things. On November 14th, for Magic the Gathering releases, Lord of the Rings has just come out, but they're going to be doing another release of other products surrounding the Lord of the Rings set in November, November 3rd. Commander Masters is coming up very soon. August 4th is the official release. We'll be we'll be doing uh, Commander Precons for Commander Masters at Gen Con. At Gen Con, yep. Probably getting some packs and stuff as well. Who knows? Uh, Wildsville Drain pre-release starts September 1st with a launch on September 8th. The Doctor Who Commander decks on October 13th, and... The Lost Caverns of Ixalan at some point in November of 2023. But our top story, of course, is Dungeons & Dragons has been showing off. Bigby presents the glory of the giants. We've we've gotten an early look. And there's some decisions that have been made. (laughs) There's some decisions. Um, Namely... They've been kind of mashing up. Uh, uh, they've been they've been they've been taking some other monstrous creatures and making giant versions of them, like the giant Illithid, mm-hmm. also known as the Mind Flare. It's uh, disgusting. I hate it, but also it's just, I'm kind of into it. Uh, in Bigby presents the glory of the giants. They've they've talked a little bit about it. Uh, the two of the main designers and writers did like a little YouTube video. Uh, they're going to delve into unrevealed giant lore, including an overview of the hierarchical structure of the Ordning and Giants religion, and ideas about giants organizations and societies across the multiverse. It's going to add giant-themed player character options, where adventurers can invoke evoke the glory of giants with one new barbarian subclass, and explore the vast world of giants with two new backgrounds, and unlock eight new feats to unleash runic magic and wield elemental power. We're finally going to get rune-related stuff. Mm-hmm. Interesting, but not a rune knight. No, because that's already a, that's a thing. Yeah, I, I could have seen them reprinting it just to make it just to longer. make it. Yeah, well, it's weird to just have one subclass. We'll get into that though. Uh, displays a wondrous collection of thirty plus magic items, including three illustrious artifacts. It's not often that we get new artifacts printed, which is pretty cool. Uh, offers a plethora of tools for dungeon masters, including layer maps, adventure hooks, encounter tables, treasures, and giant role playing inspiration. And, of course, the vast majority of the book going to be a bestiary, which uh, includes 70-plus new monsters and other enormous creatures as well. You can pre-order it if you want. Uh, I would not recommend doing that for a multitude of reasons. Um, Not least of which is the fact that 5th edition D&D is on its way out the door. (laughs) We've We've talked at length that it is very strange that they have all of these upcoming D&D book releases in in what is effectively the lame duck year of 5th edition. Yes. If you will. For those and of you that don't know the president president lame duck it's when you already you can't you're not going to be in office but you but you're not term is not over yet. Yeah, and you're not really doing much. But the thing uh, and, and yes, we know the thing is that oh this is not a new edition quote unquote this is just 5e. No, this is this they if they're, re- they're printing a brand new set of rules, and we are going to stand firmly by the fact that it should be 5.5. Of course. That being said, a lot of these things, yes, do have... Um, car- they they are designed to be carry-overable since Tasha's. Yeah, as since Tasha's, the, you can tell the design specifically as, has shifted. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, the layout of like stat blocks and 
uh, level progressions and kind of more laissez-faire attitude with some of the rules. Uh, that's definitely carrying forward through 1D&D, making more current books more easily uh, usable in 1D&D. Mm -hmm. But this product in particular just seems very strange to me because it just kind of... Is, it, let, let's go back. One of the first, the first episode of the Dungeon Bros podcast. Yes, Fizzban Treasury of Dragons. Well, oh yeah, look at that. <laughs> Fizzban's Treasury of Dragons was leading into Dragonlance. Yes. Big B presents Glory of the Giants. What is that leading into? It's not leading into Fandelver. It's not leading into Planescape. It's not leading into the Book of Many Things. Yeah. And honestly, it's kind of a copy paste of. Fisman's Treasury of Dragons. I mean, like like you said, we're seeing uh, we're seeing the the uh, mind the mind flare giant. We got the mind flare dragon. Yeah, and I get it. You know, the everybody does. You know, a lot of mashups and and sort of those things are inspired. And the mind flare is easy because the whole thing of just taking over the bodies of other creatures mm -hmm. with the tadpoles and stuff. It 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 fits in the lore. I get that. I will I will continue. To not understand, well, I, I do understand, it's because they think they can sell books and make money off of it, obviously. Uh, I don't see Big B Presents Glory of the Giants selling very well. I don't see the Practically Complete Guide to Dragons that's coming out on the same day, which, by the way, we learned is not going to be a rule book of dragon stuff. It's literally just going to be a supplemental lore piece for dragons. Yeah. Um, we were going to get to that in the wrap-up. I mean, we might as well just bring it up now. Um yeah, it's just it's just a lore book, uh, and specifically, it's an update from an old book. Oh gosh, what's it called? I, saw I think it. it was by the same name. Uh, like the complete it's... guide to dragons. It was yeah yeah. The, it updates the two thousand and six a practical a practical guide to dragons, and yeah it. It's lore. We have dragon lore in Fizzbands. We have dragon lore in. Um, in the Dragonlance campaign setting, I don't know what we would need giant lore for. I mean, I, I get it. there are. I, I bet the people who you know the the people who are writing this um, or the heads of this this project probably really really love this. Yeah, and there is definitely people out there who really really love this. But yeah, at the same time, they could have easily they could have easily said uh, you know either held it off until maybe there was a giant themed campaign yeah. or a giant you know a giant centric campaign setting that they yeah. wanted to use it in yeah but yeah for right now i mean this is a very niche set of information of of stat blocks that you're going to need like how often do you actually include a giant into one of your combats um i mean I, i'll well, include, every once in a while i'll include a troll sure you know a classic Maybe but, if you're maybe if you're specifically going to a volcano, there's going to be a fire giant. Now, I could absolutely we've we've talked we've talked before about the the. Oh my gosh, why am I drawing a blank? Not the the spaceship shit. Oh yes. Uh, oh my god, why are we both? The fucking oh my god, oh my god. The, the, they came out with three books. <laughs> they kind of weren't great. Spelljammer. There we go. The Spelljammer campaign idea of like the Gith Yankee, Gith Sarai uprising, mm -hmm. overthrowing Illithid stuff. Throwing in an Illithid giant, an Illithid dragon, all that kind of stuff kind of spices up what would otherwise be a very monotonous enemy base. Yes. And I totally get that. Why? I, it, I don't know. If you're in, if you're into it, I mean, more power to you. It's probably going to be overpriced. Uh, you don't get a digital version with them yet. Starting with one D and D books are going to have digital copy codes with them, so that you can redeem them on D and D Beyond. And if you think you might be interested in some of the things, I guarantee you this barbarian subclass is going to be on the internet within the week. I mean, the backgrounds we, within a week, the feats within a week. We already the, saw I, a lot everything. of these in a UA. Yeah, and they're probably not going to be very changed. So if you, and all UAs are still available for down free download. Um, oh yeah and uh, uh, public availability I would, I would just say go and get one of those go, che go check those out before you buy absolutely um, do you have anything else you would like to say about Big B Presents The Glory of the Giants I, I think it is kind of uh, boring I, I, I wish it were I, 
we'll have to see how what comes of it but yeah i don't think this is, i think this is just going to be another book in the series in the long series of books that don't necessarily uh that aren't necessarily going to perform as maybe wizards of the coast would have liked them to perform yeah uh this is another wrap-up item i'm going to bring up right now um you know what i would like to see a wizards of the coast book on <laughs> go ahead <laughs> I, I want to see a Wizards of the Coast book on uh, fucking things as a druid in your wild shape form. Hmm. Like in Baldur's Gate 3, the upcoming uh, D&D video game. Uh, they, they, they did some deep dives. I don't, it, it's Baldur's Gate 3. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be pretty good. If you like that kind of like computer RPG, it'll be fun. Yeah. Uh, it's got a lot of hype right now. They just announced a lot of things. Like there are going to be three subclasses per class. There's going to be over right 17,000 different and different endings yeah i mean it's i'm sure it's going to be like ah oh, this character can be here versus this character is not here yeah yeah it, it, it apparently there's more dialogue written for this game than any other piece of media that has ever existed and it's like all right we get it it's big <laughs> um they also showed a portion of the game because uh, you can romance many of the characters uh, one of which is a druid and they're and they were showing like ooh they were being they were being all flirty and then uh, dialogue options popped up and the audience read them and then they had a big reaction when one of them was highlighted and they're like you want us to click this one and they're like, ah and then they click that one and it turns out that the character that uh, the player character ended up having sex with the druid in their wild shaped form as a bear so oh. they fucked a bear um, that's um, I would like have you have you not seen that no I haven't oh. No, 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 not, not right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Baldur's Gate Three Bear. That's all. That's all you need to look up. Just look at that thumbnail. This, yeah, the thumbnail kind of says it all. Yeah. <coughs> Hold on. Here's a, here's a short. I'll turn off the audio. Come on, video play. Come on, video. Don't do me like this. Come on, video. <laughs> This is great. This is great this TV. Is great po- this is great podcasting. But yeah, the <laughs> the developers knew exactly what they were doing with that live presentation, one hundred percent. And of course, the moment that I want to try and play a video, it's like, ah, fuck you. How about that? Uh, All right. You, have, well, uh, you apparently need to connect to the internet. I guess. Whatever. I don't care. At this point, um, don't fuck bears, and probably don't get Big B presents the glory of the giants either. Yeah, w- 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 this is a weird a weird sort of podcast i feel just because we're like hey this new thing coming out don't get it also this thing is really popular coming out don't fuck bears don't fuck bears get it if you're interested in that sort of thing but don't fuck bears they they'll, you'll get mauled to death unless they happen to be a druid that's sexually attracted to you and wants to have sex with you in their bear form for some reason like i feel it okay that opens up a lot of moral questions that i don't think we have to deal with in this real world like it's one it's one thing to be like to be like ooh I'm really attracted to you and then they like fucking anamorphed into a bear and now you're like that's a hot bear that's one thing to grasp with as the person transforming into the bear how are you okay with that right you know i mean i guess that's part of your like who you are at some point i guess i mean, well yeah i mean it's just you um i feel like the i feel like there were a lot of a lot of furries in that audience. They're not possible. like, and not like, ooh, I like to wear cat ears and like put on a tail. No, I mean like furries. The full yeah. suit and the full suit, the like, the like fucking in the suits. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't ascribe to that lifestyle. That is beyond my comprehension as well. That I the furries are gonna love Baldur's Gate three. Anyway. Let's move on from this. That is that is that is the main D and D thing we have to talk about, and we honestly don't have much to say because it kind of sucks. And once they have books that are worthwhile, like I'm, I'm interested in the Fandelver and Below with the Shattered Obelisk because they've been dropping all these hints at obelisks in a whole bunch of D and D adventures for the entirety of Five E. I want to see what's up with that. You know? Yeah, I'm interested in that. Planescape, multiversal stuff, cool, totally fine. Book of many things, eh. less interesting. It's just it's just a collection of shit. I mean the the deck of many things very iconic. Book yeah. of many things. I feel like they're tr- they're just reaching a little uh, yeah a little far in trying yeah. to pull the wool over our eyes. Ooh. Pull the wool over our bare eyes. Do we have a right to bear arms. Do we have a right to bear eyes? 
Hmm. That's an unbearable question. Hey. Is that an unfuckable bear question? <laughs> Moving on uh, to to Commander Masters. Commander Masters. Uh, they've been recently announcing they've been cards. Sh- they've been shown. Well, they've shown many cards, and a lot of them that you would expect: Demonic Tutor, Doubling Season, Deflecting Swat, Cyclonic Rift, Sure, uh, Eldrazi's, all that kind of stuff. This is Magic the Gathering now. By the way. Oh yeah, we switch. We switch gears. We're we're, we're, we're we're, we're, we've moved on. They The big thing is they're starting to show the deck lists for the various uh, pre-constructed commander decks, and they've started off with the Sliver deck, the Sliver Swarm, helmed by the, sl- the Sliver Grave Mother, removes the legend rule for Slivers, and gives uh, all Sliver creature cards in your graveyard Encore X. Encore just basically pulls them out of the graveyard and makes it a copy of them. Yes. So yeah, you yeah. can you can pay the encore cost, uh, and then I believe create a copy for each opponent you have, mm-hmm. and then I believe they do. If you attack that turn, those copies have to attack those opponents. Yeah. So that's why they remove the legend rules so that you can copy. Your yeah, because there are there are several slivers. yeah several slivers that uh, like the sliver hive lord, the sliver queen, and things like that. Yes. Uh, Incidentally, the only one of those that it would really affect is the Sliver Hive Lord, as that's the only other legendary sliver uh, that's included in the deck. Hmm. Which some people were like, well, if you're going to create this commander that is just trying to pull all your slivers out of the graveyard, and it has a whole bunch of text about uh, avoiding the legend rule and all of that, maybe include all of the legendary slivers. There's only like three of them. Yeah. But they're, this, they're all expensive cards as well. Yeah, I was going to say, but at the same time, you also don't want to necessarily, uh, you know, give people room to uh, expand their own deck, you know? Yeah. I, I feel, I understand not wanting, they definitely don't want to make pre-cons to the point where it's like, ah, this is the only way this deck will ever be. And this and the sliver pre-con could definitely be in that realm. Oh, yeah. It could be upgraded quite a bit. I think there's only like three or four creatures in the deck that aren't slivers. Uh, one of them is a new designed card, a uh, five color card. It could be a commander in and of itself. It's a human wizard. Um, Rukarumel Biologist. When it ETBs, you choose a, cre- a creature type. Slivers you control and non token creatures you control are the chosen type in addition to their other types. Uh, the same is true for creature spells you control and creature cards you own that aren't on the battlefield. Uh, and you can pay three and tap it to create a 1-1 one, one colorless sliver creature token. Just basically, if you... Basically, yeah, this is basically the ultimate um, the ultimate tribal or typal uh, uh, sort of commander. Yeah, especially if you're doing, like, if you're making a sliver deck that has, like, half slivers and half value creatures mm-hmm. that have a collect a collective type like a lot there's a lot that are, that are just elf something or human something and you can choose that type to get those sliver benefits onto other creature types yes which is interesting but within the deck there's an illusion one illusion creature an illusion one human wizard which is the rukar male biologist and then just all the slivers and a changeling or shapeshifter. I think there's one sliver that ha- uh, that I've noticed so far that has a second type, which yeah, is zombie. zombie. There's the zombie sliver, but like everything else is just sliver. So while that card is cool, doesn't seem like it's going to serve much of a purpose in the deck. Um, obviously, there's the, there's a nice ramp package because it's a five color uh, deck. Uh, Mana Rocks Galore, Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, Felwar Stone, uh, Pillar of Origins, Herald's Horns, going to reduce the cost of your slivers. Uh, Icon of Ancestry, uh, going to help get them a little bit stronger. Vanquisher's Banner, kind of an anthem effect, get some drawing cards. Um, the main problem that people have is the mana base for the deck. Uh, it, it's built very similar to the other five color commander deck uh, that existed beforehand, Painbow where it had several more basic lands in it than you would normally want to run in mm-hmm. a five color deck. It had fetch lands, but they were slow fetches, so they enter tapped. Um, so you would you would have to wait a turn to untap them to then tap them to fetch a land that would also enter the battlefield most likely tapped because there are very, very few cards in the deck that tap for more than one color and then have a chance at entering untapped. They're not even they're not even always guaranteed. Um, and the ones that are, for example, Cinderglade, 
it's a mountain forest that taps for red or green. When it enters, it enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or more basic lands. Yeah. So it's not even just two or more lands. It has to be basic lands. And in a deck that only has, what would that be, 11 basic lands. Two of each type and one of a... Uh, one and, of one, a and one extra forest. One extra forest, yeah. It, it's, it's a bit tough. It is, it is a bit tough. Because it's not even... <sighs> It is fetchable, at least, because it's a mm-hmm. mountain, a mountain, uh, uh, forest. But it is, it is a rough man. It is a rough and fairly slow mana base, which might also just help tone down the power a little bit of, of the slivers, because they can kind of get out of control really quickly. Um, yeah, I, a lot of people online are complaining about it. I thought the Painbow mana base was perfectly adequate mm-hmm. for a five color deck. I repurposed it for a Jota the Unifier deck. Uh, it's not the fastest thing in the world, and I've slowly upgraded the I was mana base. Say, yeah, I've done some time. upgrading to it. Yeah, uh, and it works a lot better now. But the Painbow mana base was a much more serviceable mana base, I think, than the Sliver mana base. Uh, it's going to be really hard to get in these. Uh, I believe they're called check lands because they check for how many uh, yeah. for other lands that already exist. Um, it's going to be harder to get them in untapped because of the lower number of basic land types. And then every other dual land or multicolor land enters tapped with the exception of like your command tower, your exotic orchard, secluded courtyard, that kind of stuff. I mean, obviously, in a in a tribal deck like this, secluded courtyard, unclaimed territory, those kinds of things are going to go a long way. But it's rough. Mm-hmm. A whole bunch of of always enter tapped tri lands without cycling attached to them that aren't fetchable. Slow fetches that are basically going to be searching up basic lands, and these like kind of crappy check lands. People are upset. It's going to be a hundred car a hundred dollar deck pretty much yeah and the value of it according to uh mtg goldfish which is where we're looking at the deck list right now is like 360 dollars tabletop but that's mostly on the back of probably what four or five car five six cards that are like 30 bucks what a yeah what a a sliver hive lord uh titan of Lidjara, taunting sliver there a lot of them say 30 dollars exactly so i feel like those aren't necessarily accurate but like for the ancestors uh, that kind of stuff. True, and and they could have easily. It, that's I think a thing that uh, a lot of players would like for these precons is like yes, definitely give us these higher priced reprints. Yeah. Um, and they did really well actually for that in the Lord of the Rings Commander precons. Yes, those those are really good decks. But they still seem to not want to give the the nice lands out y'all that often. Yeah. <laughs> Which is the thing that you know every that, that's the thing that people are calling for is yeah. hey. No, no one no one wants a proxy of of uh of black lotus but yeah. it's like hey even the 15 even the ones that are 15 dollars right now you know some of the check lands that yeah those be great if we could have some reprints of those shock land pain lands mm-hmm. those co- sorts of things would be very very appreciated uh reprinting like the battle bond lands mm-hmm. the lands that enter untapped if you can tr- if you have two or more opponents that way that way if you if you're printing those you're not going to tank the prices on cards that would affect other formats, other two-player formats, and it really only would affect Commander. It would, yeah. Um, I personally would love if, in the, for future sets, uh, for example, the next one is Eldraine. Correct. We're going, we're going, yes. back, we're going back to Eldraine. Um, the fairy tale land. The fairy tale land. I would, lo- I would love to see just an elf tribal, a very basic elf tribal deck. Golgari, Simic, Mono Green. Mm-hmm. Elf Tribal with like a couple good reprint, like maybe a reprint or two that's worth like four bucks, and then just get like an amazing mana base for it. That'd be cool. If they just started doing that, then the prices of those cards would go down. Apparently, they don't look at the secondary market, which I think is a fucking load of shit when they're pricing their yes. products. But. Obviously, Wizards of the Coast should not like their pricing should not be based on the secondary market, but at the same time. They are all we we Gavin Verde plays like we know they all play yeah <clears throat> and so it's like they're not blind to it not at all but th- there's no reason there's no reason that fucking shock lands are thirty dollars mm-hmm. you know they could be yeah, they, reprints are weird 
they might and, and they might as well i don't i get i get it you also you also have to imagine though they're a company that clearly wants to make a lot of money and they want to sell a lot of magic the gathering product and we know this because they're making a lot of magic the gathering product and expecting people to buy it yeah why why wouldn't they be motivated to reprint these high value cards in commander decks that the prices of them are always going up and by reprinting these valuable the valuable lands they would f- be constantly sold out yeah are you kidding me and like, like they honestly they'd the, be able to give they'd be able to give push a bunch of like kind of crap cards that are not really worth a lot if they just had really good mana bases in them and i mean we see that like you can look at uh you know, a lot of people do do worry about price depreciation due to overprinting. But at the same time, your older cards are always going to be more worthwhile. You know, the yeah. you can have certain cards that were printed ten years ago that are fifteen dollars. You can get exact same one, except in in you know a retro frame from Brothers War that's forty five cents. Uh, and then there are certain cards, especially mana cards, that don't. The Soul Ring will not go down in price, even though they print it. Constantly. Over and over and over and over and over. The same thing would probably be fine with other with all these lands. I'm guessing the reason Soul Ring and Arcane Signet are just always going to be a couple dollars is because they're needed in every single deck, <laughs> every single Commander deck, every single Oathbreaker deck. Oathbreaker, you can't use Soul Ring. No, um, they're they're just that ubiquitous. Mm-hmm. Things like Felwar Stone, not nearly as ubiquitous. Fifty cents. <laughs> you know. You have anything else you want to say about uh, the Sliver Swarm? Well, we are going to, like we said, we are going to Gen Con here in a couple weeks, and we have signed up for some pre-con events, because actually the pre-con events, you get a pre-con deck, and then you, you play the game. And it's actually decently priced for, one, the deck, and two, you get prize tickets for doing it. So we're like, hey, oh, yeah. free prize tickets. Uh, at this point, I don't think Slivers is at the top of my list for for uh, going for playing that, oh, no, that pre-con all. event. Not at all. Uh, for the, anyone that's curious, the Commander Precon event at Gen Con is seventy dollars. Uh, so seventy dollars is not an insignificant amount of money. No, that's for it's, sure. It's basically the price of one of the decks. Um, each pod of four gets one of the four. So the four decks are presented to the pod, and mm-hmm. each player will get one of them. Um, so you're not guaranteed a specific deck if you because unless like, you're sitting with your buds unless you're sitting with your buds exactly like i'm i wouldn't want the sliver deck i don't really i'm not really feeling the i would probably go for the enchantment deck personally i think i would like to try the eldrazi deck i like big things yeah i feel like i feel like darren our friend darren would definitely want the slivers though he seems like a sliver guy you know what i'm saying slivers and walls slivers and walls baby my walls are the best walls you've ever seen my walls are going to dominate. All right, shall we move it's like on? I, it's like I stopped making videos. I don't see it recommended anymore. I, I saw one the other day. The President's Play. The Magic. President's Play. Yeah, yeah, I guess they finished the, 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 the tournament, tournament arc. <laughs> it's just so stupid. Um, one, more, one more story. Just a little wrap-up thing. Uh, we talked previously about uh, Critical Role. Uh, Ashley Johnson and uh, falling out with her former fiance, uh, Brian Wayne Foster, for allegations of um, abuse in many different ways. Uh, A new development, uh, the Critical Role YouTube channel has removed every video featuring one Brian W. Foster from its official YouTube channel. Hundreds of videos featuring days worth of content are now inaccessible in effort to completely remove the bad actor's presence from Critical Role's history. Um, And then it goes in. Uh, in solidarity with their friend and fellow actor, Critical Role has completely scrubbed Foster's presence from public history on YouTube. For several years, he acted as the host as a as the host of Critical Role appearing on the talk show Tox Machina, several one shots and side campaigns and multiple spin-off shows, and the only footage of Foster found on the Critical Role YouTube now is his brief appearance at the beginning of a handful of live shows he hosted during the Mighty Nine campaign. Foster is not the first bad actor Critical Role has had to deal with. Earliest episodes of Critical Role featured Orion Akaba as the eighth member of Vox Machina. However, disagreements and personal reasons led the actor to be removed from the show, going so far as to erase his character entirely from the Legends of Vox Machina show. Other retellings of the campaign's early history and other retellings of the campaign's early history. That said, the actual episodes featuring Orion Akaba are still available on Geek and Sundry's YouTube and are linked in the official Critical Role website. It's a whole, it's a whole thing. 
it's an unfortunate situation that has re- has ari- arisen. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, it feels bad, man. It's in it. Yes, obvious. Obviously, um, you know, Ashley's tried to keep this very private, so you should do the same. Um, we talk. We we several several episodes ago. This was probably it's maybe a couple months ago. We talked about mm-hmm. uh, the this RPG publisher that removed an artist, uh, removed their credits from some of their products and refused to work with them over political ideology. That kind of stuff, I think, is inappropriate. Removing removing credits, removing uh, the, like that credit, giving credit for work that is done is is part of the it's, you you just you just have to do that it's a, it's part of the social contract of creating content of any kind mm-hmm. publishing <laughs> video audio whatever that being said in some ways and i would i would argue this is to a lesser extent uh if you're familiar with the wwe uh, there was a wrestler by the name of chris benoit mm-hmm. chris benoit uh, was a popular wrestler people were very much enjoyed enjoyed him uh, there was one day where he and his entire family um, were found dead, and they had this big, this big like memorial remembrance episode of a Monday Night Raw. Later that week, uh, it came out that it turns out he murder suicided them, mm. so killed the killed his wife, killed his kids, killed himself, and the WWE has done pretty much everything they can to remove his presence from his name, references to him, to his moves, everything from the Monday following that onward. Like, you're never going to see him mentioned in anything that has been created since that time happened. And that feels a lot similar to what's happening right now with Brian W. Foster. The main difference is uh, the WWE didn't really go back and remove shows. Previous stuff. Previous stuff. Which, when you think about it, if you're a wrestler at the top of your game... Uh, you're gonna be you're gonna be out every week. Yeah. So they can't just remove years of WWE shows. Mm-hmm. You know, they could go in and edit them to remove him if they wanted, um, and they might have done that for some instances. But it's it's one of those things. Uh, I understand why they're removing that stuff. Um, it's a shame that we're going to to not be able to relive some amazing moments like. Uh, like uh like uh the the Sam Regal and the 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 mini primetime oh, pop the, up oh, yeah, the Will Fredell the Will Fredell pop up gra- like that kind of stuff from Tox Machina is going to be nostalgic obviously um obviously they don't want to give Brian any more air any more internet screen time yeah no more platform no more platform and i think that's fine um at the end of the day he was he was there he was always there um, don't know how long any of this was going on because Ashley and Brian are the ones that know exactly what happened and they don't seem keen on talking about it in a public forum and I would not press them about it either of them probably also some litigation that uh, is going on that and that always uh, stops people from talking oh yeah because courts are oh yeah yeah I, I, I imagine that this won't be the end of this situation no. at all um yeah, we'll, we'll keep you updated because we love Critical Role, despite the fact that we're not the biggest fans of Campaign 3. Yeah, yeah, it's, I've not been keeping up with it. Yeah, um, I have been just, I like, I want to keep up. They're doing something with the ruinous shit that is interesting to me. It just takes forever to fucking develop the overarching story. And that's kind of my issue. I'm watching, I'm, I've started watching a lot, like most, if not all of the episodes at like one and a half, 1.25 speed. Yeah. Uh, when they're in combat, I'm watching at one and a half speed. It's just like, get fucking get through a combat. I get it. You guys are fighting. Um, I haven't watched since last October. Yeah, it's... You can watch it. I think, I think recap videos are perfectly fine. It's too much. They're making too much content. They, they've scaled it back a little bit. They're doing three. Uh, they're, they're taking a week off every month. Yeah. It makes it a little bit easier. I think they, I think they could really benefit from going every other week. And then just finding other little short run one off, even um, other shows on other like the, the they were doing do a lot of that pre pandemic and yeah. and and 
I thought that was an interesting and great way for them to go mm-hmm. was making an entire channel, not just not just a deep yeah. deep show. Um, but yeah, we haven't we haven't really seen the return of that for whatever reason. Yeah, it would be yeah. They seem they seem not one they they because they added that new post game talk show, which clearly was the replacement for Tox Machina before any of the. Stuff Ashley sure. Bryan's stuff was made public. In hindsight, that's mm-hmm. clearly what that is. Yeah. But they're not doing that for every episode. They're doing that once a month. Yeah. And Isn't that is the foresight is foresight, foresight dive, dive and they do that instead of the last episode of the month, is that right? Yes. Gotcha. I believe so. Uh so that's a whole that's a whole other thing. I also think they could do to make to try and make a conscious effort to make the episodes a bit shorter. We don't need five episodes we need we don't need four and a half, five hour uh D and D games every week to watch. That's a lot of content. And it's it's a lot. Anywho, I think that's the news. That's that's about all we got to talk about this week. Uh, we will do as we always do every week, and we will go to the TikTok live chat for any questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas. Sam will do that. But first, we want to thank you guys for watching the live or listening to the Dungeon Bros podcast on podcast services around, around the globe. globe. Around the globe. Uh, YouTube Music is now available on... I, I've been using YouTube Music for several months at this point, I think. At least two. At least two. I think it's coming up on two, yeah? Two, two three months now. Uh, I like I like not having ads on YouTube. That's fair. That's why I use YouTube Music instead of Spotify, because it's, it's bundled together. But it was also available on Spotify. It's also available as a YouTube video on our YouTube channel. Uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Uh, we're hosted on Podbean as well you can find all the you can find the links to all the major uh podcasting services in the beacons link in the bio you can also find our twitter you can find instagram you can find the youtube you can find the discord server you can find our moxfield decks for our monday night magic live streams every monday at 9 p.m on tiktok live of course most people follow us on tiktok we are nearing thirty-eight thousand followers which is pretty cool if only tiktok would let people watch our videos when we post them that would be nice TikTok is a frustrating platform. <laughs> it's a very frustrating platform. Um, we have a merch store if you're interested in that sort of thing. We have an Amazon affiliate store if you're interested in that sort of thing. Uh, and with that all being said, Samuel, what does the TikTok live chat have to say this week? Randomly generated name uh, says that they are going to be applying for our uh, real life enemy position. Okay. That's available. Uh, be sure to submit your application with the moon. Uh, the moon is our secretary. That is a fucking throwback reference. Um, Jake, we'll get back to you in three to five business days. The moon does have a uh, a three week out time. Yeah, the, the, it goes through cycles. Yeah, so um, it it got to time it with that. Yeah. Uh, Jake Dot Borton says, "What advice do you have for a time travel game?" Ooh, pick a type of time travel that your world is going to operate on. Uh, you can reference many, many properties. Mm-hmm. Uh, f- if you want time to be looping and have and have it loop on itself over and over and over again until there's one sequence that breaks the loop, something like Groundhog Day, there is also the Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban style of time travel where you go back and the time traveling selves were always there to begin with. Uh, and so the flow of time and history hasn't changed. It's just your perspective on it is. Uh, and then there's branching timelines where every where the very act of you going back in time creates a separate timeline uh, that changes the outcome. And then, of course, there's the Back to the Future where it's all kind of one timeline, but mm-hmm. the specifics of it are a little goofy. I think a good a good reference would be actually Ocarina of Time. Yes. Because that's a very direct one, and that might work the best, especially if, like, oh, the time travel might only happen in a certain in certain dungeons, where it's like, okay, you have to go back to the past to do something in order to go back to the present so that you can access the new part of the dungeon. Yes. Yes. Um, that, is a, that is an interesting mechanic. Yeah, looking at video game time travel mechanics, Ocarina of Time. That's a good reference. Uh, also, don't be that DM that forces your party to interact with time with like time traveled versions of the part the player character's party. Yeah, that's weird, and that's really hard. And oh, it yeah. kind of it make it, it'll remove agency from them. Which I mean, it, time travel kind of does that if you interact with yourself, especially if you're time traveling and interacting with another version of yourself. That's time travel. Uh, if you want to go down the fucking rabbit hole, watch the movie Looper. 
That uh, one's fucking nuts. The Raven Syndicate said, hey, guys. Hey. So I'd just come by and say hi. Hey, Raven. Hello. The, the Raven, Raven Syndicate. The Raven Syndicate. Um, Arisa asks, what's something you feel is overlooked in the Guide to Wild Mount? Ooh, the Explorer's Guide to Wild Mount? What is overlooked? Um... They really pushed the Heroic Chronicles a lot during the lead up and the advertising for it. Uh, and people are just like, oh, whatever, that's that's details. There's a lot of fun charts in there for like regional favorite foods. It's always it, going through those tables and, and looking at weird little niche things you can do to give your character a little texture, you know? Those kinds of tables are really useful. Also, uh, the the four level one to three adventures in the back of the book are all very good. Um, yeah, all right. We have Anawar. Anawar. Um, how do you do... In- Several questions. I'm going to kind of... Uh, lump them all together. How do you introduce D&D to the disabled individuals like blind, deaf, and mute. How do you introduce mm. D&D to blind or to disabled individuals like blind, deaf, and mute? Um, D&D is hard to incorporate to disabled individuals. We don't have any real uh, experience with that. Not at all. But I do, I can't, I can't imagine that there is, there is so many people out there uh, who make YouTube videos, especially more so on YouTube that do have experience in this. And especially, uh, uh, when they bring it into, when teachers and other staff bring it into schools, Mm -hmm. um, and therapists bring it into therapy, uh, oftentimes to help people go through trauma. I'm sure if you looked up some of those individuals, uh, I couldn't tell you any of them off the top of my head because it's not a not, some, not, not something we've dealt with into. at this point. Yeah. Um, I I have hundred percent believe it is possible. Um, mm. The I feel like it really dealing with someone who's mute is one thing because you, you can still communicate, mm-hmm. but being able to hear and and visually see like a like a battle mat are two are two important things. Now, what I will say for a blind person, uh, theater of the mind is still a very popular way of playing D&D and is often how we run D&D campaigns outside of specific combat scenarios, but you can still run combat theater of the mind. Mm-hmm. Um, deaf, you would probably want to run more combat visually on a battle mat uh, and then come up with a way for text-based communication. Mm-hmm. Um, those kinds of campaigns, I think, work really well in a Discord setting because you can simply type into a Discord chat what your character is saying, what questions you might have, uh, and then just ha- making sure that as the DM that you are making sure, like making a conscious effort to be constantly reading and checking to make sure that you are uh, fulfilling. We have yeah, we have the a, needs of all your players. We have an internet friend, Pirate Tom, the Pirate yes. Tom, who runs a bunch yes. of text-based campaigns. Um, Maybe we'll we'll see if he has any if we uh, if we have any contact with him anytime soon. Reach uh, out to him and, and do, we a, do we have a piece of paper. We should write that down. That'd be a fun. Yeah. That'd be a fun topic for. Yeah, we'll put this on Raph Weather Light Star Wars. I don't have that deck anymore. All right, Pirate Tom. Um and uh, let's see. Randomly generated name says. I need some form of D and D for two players. I have no friends. All guess what? You can do it. We've done um, it multiple times. We've done it multiple times. Uh, the the main thing I would say, actually, there's some great YouTube videos. One is by uh, Matt Colville. He talks. He has a probably 20 30 minute vehicle video talking exactly about how he has done it in the past. Brendan Lee Mulligan has also talked about how he and his brother would just sit at the ends of their beds and play for hours when they were kids. Yeah. And then we've done it uh, as especially in run ups to campaigns like session zeros. Um, and it's it's going to be a lot more of descriptiveness. Yeah. You're going to have a lot more of the puzzle solving and exploring as opposed you can have combat uh, it's going to be much more simplified and oftentimes I like to give the player an NPC companion who's just there to agree with them and maybe heal them yeah <laughs> yeah uh, one on one D&D can be very fun there's also versions of one D&D or uh, of D&D you can play by yourself Ginny D has a wonderful video on that 
which I feel like could be very easily modified if you wanted to do like a co-op campaign style thing. Where you can play a game technically without a DM, which apparently is like the Wizards of the Coast goal <laughs> to remove the DM. <laughs> I, it's one of those things where I get it. There's a lot of there's a lot more players than there are DMs out there, but the people who love to DM love to DM, and I don't think uh, that's ever going to be as successful as oh, they're yeah. attempting it to be. Oh yeah. Um, Hoka Doodles says, "I just want to slide in and tell you how wonderful both you are." Well, thank you. You're wonderful, Hulkadoogles. Um, I'm nothing if not willing to pat my own self on the back. So thank you. Anyway, our live has actually been, I think, frozen or off for a while now. It's been yeah. doing the thing. That checks out. We couldn't pull up a video earlier. I feel like there was a, there's, it's been stormy and gross lately. So it's a whole thing. Thankfully, that doesn't really affect uh, the recording of the podcast. No. Uh, and thankfully, for those that listened to last week's episode where we went for pretty much two hours talking about one D. we're going to come in a little under an hour on this one so you're very welcome we, we like to respect your time here at the dungeon bros and Podcast, so specifically we don't respect your time just generally speaking because i mean but once you're listening to our podcast all times in. times a times a weird soup you know it's, yeah, it you, really doesn't have any meaning you know if you're if you're in a groundhog day scenario and you're listening to this uh we're here for you we are, we are, and we're going to be here for you the next time it loops, and the next time it loops, and it, may, it might, you might just need to stop listening to us, and that's what breaks the loop. That'd be weird. That would be very meta, and a very odd requirement for which to break a time loop. Uh, we'll be accepting any final applications for rivalries and evil doppelgangers and the like. Uh, we'll be accepting those through August. You can contact the moon. Uh, wait for her to be in her her full phase. That is when she is the most uh, responsive to emails. Uh, with that being said, we love you very much. And as always, peace.